welcome to another Think Like a Medical Registrar series video. My name is Dr. Vishal Kumar. I am doing a video on confusion today. Today we'll go through a scenario like we've done in all the other videos. And as always, this video will also be targeted towards, uh, towards your requirements for PACES because these are all scenarios you can get in one way or another in your PACES uh, exams in any of the stations. Sometimes these things can present even in the communication station. Okay, so I want you to pay attention. In this video, we're going to be talking about the scenario. First of all, I'll take you through that and then I'm going to get you to tell me what you think like the other videos. Okay, so first of all, you're going to tell me what your impression is, what you think might be causing the issues at hand, and then we'll talk about the management plan, and then we'll review the scenario itself, okay, and with the key considerations, and finally, we'll get to the really juicy bit, which is the bite-sized bundle for paces. In this particular video, I've had to split it because there's quite a lot of really important information that I'm going to be covering, so make sure you stay until the end because you don't want to be missing out on that, guys. As always, if you see the symbol, the bell symbol, then make sure you pause the video and uh, basically follow the instruction that I'm asking you, okay? Whether that's the management uh, or the differential diagnosis so that you get the most out of this video, all right? Let's get started. So here's the scenario. Catherine is a 74-year-old lady from a care home who has been ad admitted to uh, A&E with an unwitnessed fall and confusion. Now, this is a very common scenario, okay? Little old ladies from care homes get admitted to uh, hospitals all the time. So she was treated for a suspected urinary tract infection, UTI, recently by her GP. And her past medical history includes ischemic heart disease, hypertension, and osteoarthritis. Sure, a lot of you are familiar with this sort of situation where, you know, an elderly lady has been admitted uh, following a recent infection or a suspected infection and has been treated for it. Maybe she was confused uh, before she got admitted, okay? Maybe she uh, was confused and that prompted the GP to think maybe this is a urinary tract infection um, and uh, gave her the antibiotics, okay? And maybe now she's finished, but she has somehow fallen, uh, which is unrelated to the urinary tract infection, suspected urinary tract infection. Or maybe the urinary tract infection and the fall are both related. Uh, we, we don't really know. Or maybe the fall is related to the uh, past medical history that she's got, the ischemic heart disease, the hypertension, osteoarthritis. Um, or maybe the confusion is related to the past medical history. We, we don't really know, okay? But any of these possibilities are there. You know, you have to think about all of them, basically. All right, so now there are no infective symptoms when you assess her. Um, uh, although she's confused, the carer who you call tells you all of this information. Okay, no infective symptoms. And the urine culture that was sent by the GP has now come back and that has grown no organisms. So now there is no real evidence for a urinary tract infection. Okay, so you don't now know what might be going on as of yet. On examination, the GCS is 14 out of 15, so she's got confused speech. Everything else is fine. So she's obeying your commands, uh, she's uh, got her eyes open spontaneously, okay, without any issues, uh, but she's slightly muddled, slightly confused. Hence why the GCS is 14 as opposed to 15, but otherwise completely normal. She's in no respiratory distress, so maybe she's not really got any infection underlying, right? And she's uvolemic as well. This is important because if they are, say, uh, hypovolemic, for instance, if they are dehydrated, they are more likely to be in some kind of renal impairment, which can cause patients, especially elderly patients, to be confused. Uvolemic patient, though, mm, so this, this means that you need to do a bit more digging. You need to find out a bit more what might be going on underneath, okay? So let's see. Here are the medications that she, said, uh, that she takes. Lisinopril, 10 mg once a day, uh, amlodipine, 10 mg once a day as well, um, bisoprolol, 2.5 once a day, aspirin, 75 once a day, and omeprazole, uh, 40, 40 once a day, as well as atovastatin. So, very common medications, okay, nothing particularly that might cause uh, someone to become confused from what I can see, no opiates or sedatives. Um, so, we don't know just yet, okay, so let's see, you send off some 
blood test and, and, and admit her, rightly so, okay, uh, to see what might be going on. And you find this, the sodium comes back with the level of 118. Now, normally, the sodium levels are between 135 to 145 normally, okay, in most labs around the country in the UK. 118 is a very low level, okay? This is a level that you do not discharge patients with. You need to investigate this. You need to find out what might be going on. And you definitely, even if you don't always have the answer, well, you definitely need to correct this, all right? Otherwise, the patient will not get better. It is unsafe, okay? So the sodium is very low, okay? So potassium is 3.9. Now, this is important because if the sodium is really low, uh, you need to find out what the potassium is because if the potassium is really high, you might be thinking of what? Quick thinking now. Tell me what you think. You might be thinking of stuff like primary adrenal insufficiency, okay? Or Addison's disease, that is, as it is known as. Uh, because that's uh, that can cause the potassium to rise. Um, dehydration can also cause that kind of picture, but less likely. Addison's is the one thing that you should think of, okay? All right, so urea is 6.6, .6, quite uh, reassuring. And creatinine is 79 quite fine as well. EGFR is 88, reasonable. So other than the sodium, we don't have much else going on here. Uh, all the other blood tests are normal, okay. And the chest x-ray is also fine. There are no infective changes, uh, no suspicious lesions either. These are, again, very important. Uh, we'll come to that later, but they can be linked to the low sodium, okay? Both the infection in the chest and also uh, possibly malignant lesions, all right? So the sodium is very low here. So hyponatremia of this level can definitely cause someone to be confused, okay? Let alone elderly patients who are physiologically kind of impaired. They've got low physiological reserves. Um, even people like you and I, you know, hopefully you are fit and well. I'm more or less fit and well, I'm okay. You know, a sodium of that level can cause anyone to be confused, really. What is your differential and further management for the confusion? What do you think is causing the confusion and what are you going to do about it, okay? Come up with a plan and come back to the video. Okay, so here's the differentials that I think are reasonable, okay? So we have a lady, an elderly lady, who has basically had an unwitnessed fall and she is confused. We don't really know what the confusion is in terms of the timeline, where it might have started, um, but I think these are the reasonable differentials at this point, okay? First and foremost, it's intracranial hemorrhage because of the fall. We can't rule out a bleed in the in the brain, okay? So uh, confusion, if especially if it has started after the fall, could well be because of the intracranial hemorrhage, okay? So you need to scan the patient. Hyponatremia of unknown cause, that definitely can be contributing to the confusion. And of course, dementia, we don't know when the confusion started. She's confused, but did the confusion lead to the fall or did she become confused after the fall? Or are they unrelated? We don't know, okay? So uh, has she been confused for months and years? We, we don't really know uh, at this stage. So what should we be doing then? Um, so this is what I think you should do so you run some tests okay you run some tests and get the ct head which basically is fine more or less there is no evidence of hemorrhage and there are some involutional changes and widespread small vessel disease now these kind of changes occur over time okay they they are long-standing changes so not all patients with dementia will have them, but they are more likely suggestive of a patient with dementia. So maybe this is worth looking into, okay? Now, the other thing which is absolutely vital in a patient who is confused is collateral history. Collateral history basically means getting the patient's baseline history of cognition and function and symptoms from somebody else who knows them, okay? Sometimes this is a family member who sees them regularly, like their daughter, son, nephew, grandchildren, etc. 
Sometimes it is a carer. Sometimes it is a care home staff, like a nurse, for example, or a care home manager. Okay, so they may not always be present on scene when you arrive. Okay, so sometimes you may have to call them, ring them over the phone, and ask them what's going on. So that's what you do. Okay, because you're a reasonable clinician, that's what you do, and uh, you find out that this is what's going on. You confirm. That the acute confusion actually started over the last two to three weeks, not months and years, but quite recent, about two to three weeks, so very recent. Normally, she's fully alert and she's fully orientated in time, place, person. She knows exactly what's going on, very with it, and she has a coherent conversation like you and I are. So, this is a lady who's basically uh, generally fit and well, has got some ischemic cardiac background, osteoarthritis, but otherwise she's completely with it, okay? So it doesn't sound like she has got dementia then. Okay, so what do we think is going on then? And the confusion actually predates the fall. So the fall has not led to the confusion. The confusion happened before the fall happened, okay? So... Confusion is about two to three weeks, and then the fall happened overnight, which was unwitnessed, and that's why she's been brought in. Okay, so that's the that's the timeline now. It's a bit clearer, and there has been some changes with the medications. The uh, care home staff tells you, but uh, she doesn't really know what the changes have been. So now this give, this might be giving us some clues as to what might be going on then. Okay, so what is your diagnosis now? Tell me the one thing that you think is causing the patient's confusion. Come on. So I think it is hyponatremia, and I think it is multifactorial, most likely. Most cases of hyponatremia are usually uh, multifactorial, okay? So in her case, I think it's due to her medication and possibly syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, SIADH. Surprisingly, SIADH is actually quite common, in my experience at least. It happens quite frequently, um, so it's always something worth considering, okay? But of course, you should always uh, look out for other causes of hyponatremia as well every single time especially if it is as significant as this okay now let's see what medications could be causing the hyponatremia then she's on lisinopril she's on amlodipine bisoprolol aspirin omeprazole and atovastatin now of these there are two okay that are causing or contributing to the hyponatremia and i think it's these two if you got them well done because uh, not everyone knows that and this is important for you to know ace inhibitors can definitely cause uh, hyponatremia and so can proton pump inhibitors this is largely um you know well established and Basically, what you should do in this sort of situation is that hold these medications, okay? Stop these medications whilst the sodium is so low and possibly not start them at all and conv and uh, swap them onto a different alternative. That's what I would recommend, okay? So let's go back to Catherine, our little old lady from the care home. So let's see what she came in with then, the cluster of symptoms. So she had an acute history of confusion over the last two, maybe three weeks, and she was on multiple medications, which could be contributing to the low sodium. And maybe she also has other causes uh, that might be causing the low sodium as well. We don't really know at this stage. But remember, you sent off some tests uh, for uh, hyponatremia, and some of them are back now. The serum osmolality is 230. That is... I'm going to tell you low, okay? That is low, especially if you compare it with the urine osmolality, which is 570, which is definitely much more concentrated. So this tells you that the um, osmolality is lower in the serum compared to the urine, okay? So this is probably a dilutional effect of some sort. Maybe this is SIADH, possibly, okay? We don't know yet, but this is more likely now. You fluid restrict her to 1.2 liters per day, all right? So this might sound quite drastic, but remember, she's not a very big lady. She's quite small, so this might be okay in someone like that. And what do you find? You find that on day seven of admission, the sodium has responded very well and it has gradually climbed up. And now it has 131, which is a perfectly safe level. It, 
most people tolerate 131 of sodium perfectly fine and uh, this is not uh, a level that is low enough to cause uh, confusion or other symptoms okay so this is a safe level and you have managed to basically treat it it's not always possible to find an underlying cause for low sodiums. Uh, that is definitely something you should be aware of. You always need to investigate it, but it's not always possible to find a definitive cause, okay? but it is important to treat it and you've done that and you've got it right so with hyponatremia the problem is that it is not very well managed most of the times okay uh, most people uh, mismanage it or don't know what to investigate for or don't know how to interpret the investigations properly in which case you should always ask for an endocrine team to review okay so while hyponatremia is a general medical issue especially if it is low as low as uh, if it is less than 125 certainly it warrants an endocrine team review okay so in your exams be aware of what causes it and how to overall manage it but also have a low threshold for saying that you would rec uh, you would ask for an endocrine team review all right so let's move on to the juiciest bit of the uh, presentation, the bite-sized bundle for paces. Okay, we've been coming to this all this time. I've split it into two different sections because there's a lot of good information that you need to be aware of, okay? Especially for this sort of situation, hyponatremia. First of all, we're going to be covering uh, the causes for hyponatremia. I'm going to split it down into really easy bits, okay? So it's going to be uh, causes based on losses, which is hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic, okay? So three different columns. It's all based on the fluid status of the patient, hypo you or hyper okay so let's start with the hypo so these are the losses that you have in the body so losses such as diarrhea and vomiting okay so you lose salt from within the gut itself diuretics can cause losses so if you are on furosemide or spironolactone that can cause the sodium levels to go down or even something like pumetanide a stronger loop diuretic okay so diuretics a lot of elderly patients are on them they can cause hyponatremia surgical wounds especially if they are um, if they've recently had a surgical wound and if they are open if they are leaking can cause loss of sodium and of course burns you won't really see burns as a medical team but this is just something for you to be aware of okay the top three causes are the main things that you definitely should be aware of diarrhea vomiting diuretics okay you will see this all the time okay euvolemic causes there are plenty of them and you need to be aware of all of them my friend because uh, all of them can come up in your exam and also your real life syndrome of inappropriate adh secretion siadh as i mentioned earlier really common in life really common in practice make sure you know how to manage it it is largely based on uh, fluid restriction you need to make sure that you check the patient's serum osmolality and urine osmolality and compare them and also rule out other causes before reaching a diagnosis of siadh okay so these are the other causes that you should be also looking at for example hypothyroidism okay so hypothyroidism can certainly cause hyponatremia adrenal insufficiency so if you've got an adrenal that is uh, adrenal glands that are not functioning adequately that can cause adrenal insufficiency and cause low sodium as well as the high potassium other uh, clues for adrenal insufficiency insufficiency would be stuff like you know darker palmar creases for example or the oral mucosa pigmentation in the oral mucosa you will have patients with uh, low blood pressure low blood uh, glucose levels these are all signs of adrenal insufficiency okay medications of course like diuretics there are other medications which we covered earlier like uh, ppis proton pump inhibitors uh, and ace inhibitors that can cause um, the sodium levels to go down as well as intracranial lesions now intracranial lesions doesn't have to be a malignancy a space occupying lesions even sometimes bleeds can cause them and definitely infectious causes like encephalitis meningitis uh, can cause hyponatremia um, if 
they have got something in the brain. Okay, basically, most intracranial issues can cause hyponatremia. Basically, all right. Uh, pneumonias, especially the atypical pneumonias, can cause hyponatremia. In fact, hyponatremia can be a clue in a patient with a pneumonia that maybe this is an atypical pneumonia, and you should definitely uh, be thinking of an atypical pneumonia screen in that sort of situation. Okay. Malignancy, bronchial malignancy, uh, especially small cell lung cancer, can cause um, low sodium, and this is via the route of SIADH. So this is uh, linked to SIADH, okay? Um, and at, that can basically cause hyponatremia. This is a paraneoplastic phenomenon, and like many other paraneoplastic phenomena, the issues can be kind of multiple, okay? So that can be an underlying issue of the cancer, but there are added issues. So that that can that's that's another way that it can manifest, that, which is why sometimes you would consider a, a body scan, okay, chest, abdomen, pelvis, in patients who are frail, elderly, have had weight loss, if you can't find out the causes of the uh, hyponatremia to investigate for malignancy. All right. So we've covered hypo and euvolemic causes. Now we're going to move on quickly to the hypervolemic causes. So hypervolemic, quite simple, really. It basically means fluid overload. You've got loads of fluid on the body. It's all dilutional effects, okay, more or less. And uh, you can have fluid on the body for many reasons. This can be, be uh, this can be because of cardiac failure, renal failure, or hepatic failure. All right. Cardiac failure. Cardiac contractility is poor. Um, left ventricular function can be uh, can be poor, so you retain fluid. Renal failure, um, you basically do not excrete as much water as you normally would. Hepatic failure, you have got low protein reserves, so you essentially retain fluid. Okay, so all these things can cause hypervolemic uh, hyponatremia. Okay. I would suggest that you take a quick screenshot of this because this is a very, very good uh, slide in my view. I have put a lot of effort into this. I hope you find this useful. Let's move on quickly to the last uh, slide, which is again a quick rundown of what you should be doing. First and foremost, in the history, you should be asking about certain uh, specific things for hyponatremia. This would be things like the change in medications. So in this lady, she did have a change in medications. We didn't know earlier, but later on, your, the carers told you that, um, you know, uh, this was probably the lisinopril and the omeprazole that may have been changed or increased in dose. Um, that's the change in medication. Fluid and salt intake, you would be surprised at how many patients often increase or decrease their fluid or salt intake prior to having low sodium levels like this okay a lot of patients are often advised to drink plenty and so they do so they do drink plenty and what happens is that they drink too much sometimes they can drink up to three to four liters a day okay and that can push their sodium down diarrhea and vomiting and constitutional symptoms so uh, diarrhea and vomiting for obvious reasons of sodium loss but constitutional symptoms like night sweats weight loss low appetite can all point towards a malignant lesion okay that's why that's important examination fluid status so that that can help you classify where the sodium loss might be happening okay and investigate and management um, and manage the patient appropriately the first step you should be doing is to stop any exacerbating medications, okay? The first step is always to do no harm. So stop anything that might be aggravating the situation. So stop any meds, okay? That might be causing the sodium to go down. And then you perform basic tests. So this would be things like the paired serum and urine osmolality to look at what the concentration levels are, okay? And uh, thyroid function tests. So this, this would be comprised of the uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. 9EM cortisol will uh, tell you what the um, cortisol so levels are so if it's low then you could then be thinking about whether this could be adrenal insufficiency then you might then move on to a short synecdon test okay chest x-ray to look at evidence of any pneumonias or um, lesions within the chest cavity itself and CT hand for similar similar reasons okay and uh, lastly, you would consider short synecdon test, as I said earlier, if, especially if the uh, 9 a.m. cortisol is low. 
and CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. That's what CAP stands for, all right? So the uh, CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis would be to look for evidence of malignancy, which can be causing a paraneoplastic uh, syndrome causing low sodium, all right? So I hope this makes sense, guys. I hope you found this useful. If you did, then make sure you check out my book online. Uh, it is available in the Kindle format and also the paperback. It is linked in the description down below as well as my course. I will see you in the next video.